Welcome to How Not to DM. I'm your host, Derek. Thanks for joining me on my quest to interview the very best dungeon masters on this plane of existence. Carrie, the DM for Crossroads Games, can always be found hard at work on her next creative TTRPG stream. She specializes in running lots of different kinds of games, types of adventures, and stories. Carrie has a flair for horror and suspense, even through a streamed game medium, which I think is really difficult and hard to pull off. So she is very talented, and I can't wait for you all to hear about what makes her tick. Enjoy. I saw this crazy show on YouTube called Critical Role, and I was like, what is this? Hold on, because I was just into voice actors. And so, of course, YouTubing, you know, Ashley Johnson or Laura Bailey, that's going to come up. And I had no idea what it was. And I was like, I don't know, 10 minutes into the first episode. And I was like, I need to do this. How do I get into this? So I just started getting some people together and made the mistake of being like, I'll run a game. And now I will forever run a game. (laughs) I say mistake. I love GMing. It is my favorite seat at the table, for sure. I agree. Like, I love playing, but I'm like you. It scratches an itch that -hmm. nothing else does. You know, I've never found anything else quite like it. And I don't think I ever will. You know, it's, it's just such a different kind of creativity that you get to exercise. And it's awesome. Yeah. So, yeah, you kind of just... After deciding I want to do this, you ended up being the one in the GM seat. So tell us a little bit about that. You know, what was your first game kind of like and your GMing journey so far? Yeah, the first game was like very loosely 5e. We couldn't afford any of the books or anything. So Uh we were just kind of like making up our own rules. It was actually like a zombie apocalypse 5e sort of situation and we made up our own classes and Mm -hmm. rules i was like making games before i realized what that even was and we were all like super into it at the time so we would play it had to be like minimum five days a week after work everybody would just get together and play and i'm like man i took that for granted (laughs) five days a week big time (laughs) and i mean you could play that much now but you don't get a you know, sit around the table with each other. It's definitely different. But Mm -hmm. yeah, that's impressive. All of your schedules lined up that easily. Wow. Yeah. The thing I love asking people is about the big lessons you feel like you've learned from mistakes you've made while running games. And they can be like specific instances, or maybe like big overarching things that you feel like happen a lot in your games or happened a lot that you kind of noticed and tried to fix. So yeah, what are some of the things you've learned along the way as you've been running games? I think the main thing is gauging the story in a way where it can be rewarding as a small story or as a kind of larger story as well. A huge mistake I made was kind of planning this huge, you know, like end game reveal that was going to be super cool. And then schedules stopped lining up and meetings stopped happening I mean, everybody's been there. I've really applied that to what I'm doing online now. Most of my actual plays connect with each other in some way or another, even if they're different systems. There will be something kind of weaving them together. So in my brain, I have this huge overarching story, but you can watch four episodes of this, and that's a story by itself. So just kind of taking that, you know, overarching story from myself, because that's what makes me happy, but microdosing it in a way to where it's easy to consume for other people and for the players who can't commit to that long of a, of a story or a campaign. I noticed I do this as well. And I think it's an excellent tip trying to chop it into smaller bits. Like you said, that have payoffs on their own, instead of having to build up to something specific, only serving that one purpose. So That's an incredible thing to learn. And I think that it definitely comes with practice and time. But the sooner that anybody can kind of pick it up and figure that part out, the more engaging their stories are going to become in smaller and larger chunks. So awesome Mm -hmm. advice. Having run lots of different kinds of games for friends and then also for audiences and that kind of thing, what do you feel like some of your favorite memories are of 
moments in your games that have stuck with you all that you kind of still chuckle about from time to time or that were really epic and emotional and meaningful? Anything like that you want to share? The first thing that popped into my mind, I'm just going to say two words and then I'll explain ice potato. Okay. We were in like my homebrew world, you know, we're up in this really northern town called All Winter. Self explanatory there. And they found this like shapeshifter, basically, but they couldn't shapeshift themselves. They could only shapeshift ice. Like that was specifically only what they could do. And so. The party, obviously, is explaining or is asking, okay, can you shape ice into this? Can you shape ice into this? And every character had this really intricate thing that they wanted ice to be shaped into. And then the barbarian says, can you make a potato? And so they literally just made a little (laughs) potato and we're all cracking up already. And then he goes to eat the potato and someone's like, wait a minute, does it stick to his tongue? And I'm like, you know what? We're doing this now. So we made some rolls, and with a natural one, it became one of the funniest moments of the campaign. Nice. Real Christmas story vibes there. Yes, exactly. (laughs) Uh, I love that. If I had to pick, like, an emotional moment, that actually we do have recorded, and it was in our Deadlands campaign, Deadlands the Crossroads, and some of my favorite moments are when I just shut up. And the players are able to just weave themselves into RP that, like, you can't plan for that. Like, you can't plan for the players being this spectacular. It was between Willie Colstock and Jonah Ward, Katie Brennan and, and Caleb Miller. They just pulled off this big plan that could have gotten Jonah killed. And, like, Jonah knew that. Jonah lied to Willie about what was going to happen, you know, just this huge emotional moment. And when they got out, Willie's reaction to it and immediate like voice crack and like bursting into tears and yelling at him for almost dying. It was a moment where everybody is just sitting there silently letting them go. Oh man, it was so good. Those emotional moments will forever be some of my favorite things that could ever happen at the table. There's something to be said for raw performance like that raw improvised performance that really hits you unlike anything else can yeah i've been very very lucky with some super talented players at a lot of my tables and i'm very thankful for all of them you've had quite the roster so far on that note is there anybody out there who you really would like to play with that you haven't had a chance to yet there are a lot of people that i haven't played with that i have lined up that I haven't announced yet. Oh, yeah, nice. Honestly, I'm going to say no, not really. I feel so lucky with the people that do sit at my tables. I'll have them back any day. Cool. When you are thinking about who to invite to your games, what kind of things are you looking for that you think really fit well with your style? And then what do you think makes an ideal TTRPG player in general? You know, what makes them good at that and uh, really jive with what you do? I think someone who knows how to have a good time in the spotlight, but someone who also knows when it's not their turn to take the spotlight. Most tables that I have that people like compliment the entire table, it is when they're saying, wow, we all had such a good moment in this and you really know when to step back and you really know when to step up and just kind of that knowledge, that experience. When I'm looking to cast someone, if I've had them at a table before, I kind of know their vibes. So I'm like, oh, hey, you'll fit in this one really well. That or I, if I know two people and those two people haven't met and I know you're going to vibe, I'll kind of toss you together. I really pride myself on my vibe checks. I have put together some really good tables, and that is one of the few things I will take credit for. <laughs> You're like the TTRPG matchmaker yeah, out there making yeah. friendships happen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Welcome to Wingfire
Let's move on to Quickfire Chaos. I'll let you decide. Do you want to do a city quest or a fetch quest kind of prompt here? Let's do a city quest. Cool. So I'm going to need four D100 rolls from you. The first one will be the kind of voice your NPC speaks with. Not accent, but like kind of how they speak. I got a 67. A mouthful of gravel. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Gruff, raspy, and deep. Party sometimes has to ask them to repeat themselves several times before <laughs> receiving a clear response. <laughs> Amazing. You're going to have fun with that one. Personality trait is next. 11. One who is strongly partial to one's own group, religion, race, or politics, and is intolerant of those who differ. Ooh, boy. Okay, Ooh. so <laughs> you're a Republican. <laughs> Third one is your job. 19. A carpenter. Great. The last one. 22. A thief has stolen a basket of yours and runs off. And so you need us to help catch the thief. Amazing. I will play a dwarf rogue who's kind of like a detective type, does investigation around the city. So maybe that's why you've contacted me. It is a perfectly sunny day. And the sun is like beating down on, on all of the people on the streets and the buildings. There's one building that is only partially constructed. And my crew, the best crew, obviously, is constructing this building using just beautiful craftsmanship, best tools that there are. And... I'm without my tool bag because mm. somebody ran off with it. So you were called and you were given a, a brief description and you see this character standing there kind of looking at this half-built construction site here, hands on hips, obviously like fuming, just very, very angry and kind of like spits on the ground a couple times just waiting for you to arrive. I will approach them, wiping the sweat from my brow as it is such a sunny day, and say gruffly, uh, uh, Hello there, uh, are you the carpenter I'm here to uh, do a job for? Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Damn, I stole my tools. Um, I, uh, yes, uh, sorry, uh, my ears aren't, aren't quite what they used to be. Uh, can you can you say that again? I said the damn guy stole my tools. Ah, I see, uh, Yes, right. That, so, so someone nicked your tools off you, and, and that's why you reached out to me, right? Uh, did you get a good look at, at who they were? Oh, we're not. <laughs> spits, and you see like two chunks of gravel plopping out onto the ground. <laughs> Actual gravel. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't see them. They were all hooded. You didn't see them? They had a hood on, right? I understand that. Mm -mm -hmm. Right. Uh, what color was the hood? Oh, so it's a Black, red hood. brown. Red. Red. red hood. Oh, that's quite an interesting garb. Uh, that'll stick out in the city like this. Yeah, pretty easy. Fine, you should go find it. Uh, I will, I will. Uh, were, you, were you on your way to the job when they nicked your tools? Or were you right here? Or were you at home? Uh, where, where did this happen? I was right here. And I went over to get started. <laughs> and then they were gone. Right. Uh, uh, which way did they head after they, they, they grabbed them? You see them look both ways. Uh, that way. All right. Uh, I'm very confident in your answer. <laughs> and and uh, I'll uh, get looking for a, a fella in a red hood. Um, a description of the bag. Leather, I'm assuming, full of, full of fine woodworking tools. Anything specific is your, is your, your initials uh, stamped in there or something that I can use to identify them. There's a there's a golden hammer. Hmm. Right. Quite unique. That should be easy to spot. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you've got yourself a deal, friend. I'll go find the tools. I can see it's holding up your work, and I'm sure time is money in your business uh, as it is in mine. So, uh, my daily rate is uh, five gold a day. Is that agreeable? How about, how about a gold hammer? O oh, you give me the hammer. Hmm. Ah. Uh, I think 
We can tentatively agree on that. Yes. Great! <laughs> well, sir, uh, I will head off in that direction, start looking for red hoods, start uh, uh, polling the uh, the uh, city folks, see if they've seen anything, and I'll be uh, back with it as soon as possible. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, good day to you, sir. And, uh, and uh, good luck with uh, the rest of your work. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be fun to edit. <laughs> <laughs> I love the actual gravel, too. Nice yep, touch. Yep. I just had to. <laughs> you had to. I mean, it said it right in the description. <laughs> Changing gears now into your content creation and, and um, your work with Crossroads Games. How did you get from running games for your friends to deciding you wanted to stream TTRPGs and finding lots of different people, you know, to all come together, you know, that whole thing. What was the process kind of like? So my home group just kind of fell apart due to, you know, just life, drama, life, Mm -hmm. all that good stuff. Then I was just kind of bummed because I didn't have anybody to play with. And I was like, oh, man. And then my partner, Jenna, encouraged me to play online. And I was like, "Mm, I don't really know if I'll like that. So I put it off for a while and then she finally was like, how about you just try it? So I went ahead and gave it a shot. I was just like, okay, I'll run a 5e one shot online. And it's actually terribly edited. It's called the Orb of Arwick. If you (laughs) want to stalk my channel and find it, it is the first video I've uploaded and it was so much fun. And then after I ran a couple one-shots, I was like, you know what? Let's just dive into some sort of campaign here. So then I was like, I'll try a new system because that's what you should do. The first time running a campaign online is you should try a whole new system. So I ran Deadlands the Crossroads (laughs) and it didn't blow up necessarily, but it blew up for me. And like, I met so many amazing people from it. And I'm I'm so thankful that Jenna convinced me to... (laughs) play online (laughs) basically is what that comes down to yeah shout out to supportive partners yeah yeah definitely the people who who convince you to do stuff that you really enjoy and who are supportive of the stuff that you find fun those are the people you keep around for sure Mm -hmm. exactly deadlands crossroads i feel like is the first thing that i saw pop up on my twitter feed that you were running i think that's the first time i saw you in the community so yeah you're right it really did kind of increase your sphere of influence as they say you've run lots of different systems lots of different kinds of games with different people on streams and after that that you know those first few one shots i'm sure you kind of figured out and got into more of a a system you kind of started forming some habits and stuff so talk to us about your preparation for games especially these different kinds of stories different systems and different groups of people How do you go about planning for stuff that's so vastly different each time you're going to do it? It's absolute chaos, and it is really far in advance. That is another huge thing that I have (laughs) kind of learned just from doing various cast members, various systems, because, man, you have to plan in advance depending on who is going to be in it also, like their schedules. I tell people nowadays, I'm like, hey, you got to get me two months in Uh advance for something because I am a very busy person. I'm pretty sure I had to schedule you two months in advance. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Honestly, the easiest part is the writing and the storytelling. Like I have been writing in some fashion that I can find evidence of since like the fourth grade. So that creative aspect of it is not difficult for me at all. You can tell me a system and I'll be like, "Mm, yeah, I'll have that written for you in two days. Just give me a minute. Give me an hour at a computer and I'll have a concept at least. So the creative part is the easy part. Thank goodness. That does make sense. And honestly, uh, the timeframes make sense too. Otherwise, it would be really hard to nail down four to six people's schedules or to like make sure that everybody could be there unless it is a few months in advance. And that's mm-hmm. maybe something that people should consider when they're thinking about trying to start their own streams is just how difficult it is. Unless you're all friends and you have a regularly scheduled game and you just want to start streaming it, it's tough to 
kind of get that stuff together. And like I said, even more impressive that for you, it's been different groups of people and different systems. That's a lot to juggle at once. And it's really impressive when people can pull it off as well as you have. Well, thank you. A lot of the stories you've been telling tend to have horror undertones, if not, you know, straight up horror themes. What do you connect to most within the horror genre? And why do you think humans in general are drawn to these types of horror stories? What makes them so interesting and engaging for us? I think we as humans like to be scared, especially when we know we can be safe while we're being scared. There's something about the safety of friends sitting at a table and, hey, guess what? I'm just going to scare you to death. What I love so much about it is the amount of trust that is placed in me as you are sitting around my table and I'm going to watch your anxiety levels raise, basically, but you trust me to be the one to do this, to tell this story. And we are telling this story together. I love the feeling of being scared. It is very hard to scare me. So I use a lot of imagery, I feel like, because my fear was that horror wouldn't be able to be as effective through screens. Right. You can be in person and you can turn the lights off and you can have like creepy candles going or whatever. But that is one of the absolute biggest compliments I have ever gotten is if you tell me, hey, that was scary or hey, I was I was freaking out. That was awesome. That's great. I live for those compliments because it is very hard to describe something in a way that is actually going to give you that sense of like, oh, I'm watching a horror movie or I'm playing a horror game. So we just love to be scared. I think we do too. I think you're absolutely right in that it is one of the most difficult emotional responses to elicit from people just via verbal communication. In person, you can do a lot of different stuff. With a TTRPG, you can have like spooky maps and maybe some like spooky music or whatever. But yeah, it's just a lot harder to do that through the internet. And it's always impressive. It's one of my favorite feelings when I have, as a DM or GM, described something, you know, made the imagery so intense in playing that I've elicited some kind of like physical response from people like fear or, you know, like people being grossed out by something that I describe or really excited or ecstatic about it. I don't know. It's uh, one of the big payoffs for me. And I can tell it's one for you too. Yeah, for sure. And talking about the music too, that was a huge fear because I don't play music while we play. I always add music in post because I don't want to set the scene. I want the players to tell me how we're feeling and I put the music in response to that. So that's another cool thing is, hey, I can scare you and we don't even have creepy music going. So awesome. Yeah. That's been a funny product of seeing a lot more people pre-record stuff and then stream it later. But I think it really adds to it in a fun way. So love that. So you've run a few different systems so far. Do you have a favorite system you like to run? And then on the other side of things, do you have a favorite system you like to be a player in? And are they different? Yes, I love running anything Savage Worlds. The Suede system is wonderful. I recently ran a Street Wolves one shot, and it was one of the funnest things I have ever ran for a one shot, ever. I had so much fun. I st- I didn't stop talking about it for like three weeks, and now it's about to air. So I'm like, oh, for the excitement all mm-hmm. over again. Here we go. Playing, though, I have played through a Delta Green campaign called Impossible Landscapes. It was so much fun and so rewarding. We played for like, I think it was every other week for about nine months. It was a decent chunk of time and it was so just rewarding at the end. It was so much fun and I need to play more Delta Green. So if I have time, I would love to play Delta Green with someone again. I have a few friends who play it and they love it. And I've heard some fun things about it. So makes a lot of sense. I love Savage Worlds too. I got to play it with some of my friends two weeks, one shot a while back. It was for Halloween last year. So that was super fun. I know your Street Wolves game as well. Another guest from season two, Cassie Mothwin, was part of the cast there. So that should be out by the time this episode is out. So everybody go check out that Street Wolves game on Carrie's channel. 
there'll be links in the show notes for you to go check that out. So awesome. You know, you've been creating content for a bit here. You've kind of done a lot of different stuff. What are some of your goals maybe for the next year or so for Crossword Games? And then beyond that, what are some of like your really big dreams? You know, where do you want to take this thing if you could? What's kind of your hope for where it ends up? Very, very shortly, either maybe right before this episode releases or right after, we're making a huge announcement for Crossroads yeah. Games. I'm actually partnering with someone and we're really pushing for monetization on YouTube right now. And then once we can kind of cross that threshold, we're going to really dive into more of a company side of things. Crossroads Games is going to be more of like a production company of sorts. So I'm very, very excited for that. And I just have such a love for editing. I know, I'm weird. Editing, putting in sound effects, I love it so much. So I'm like, hey, let's do it. Let's just do that. So we are really pushing Crossroads Games into more of like an, a production company of sorts. I just want to make great content that people enjoy. Honestly, it's a good goal. I don't think I have any greater goal for this show other than just help people meet new creators and learn new things about how to run games. I feel like that's the best goal at the end of the day. But that sounds really exciting. And it's good that you like editing because you kind of alluded to it, but a lot of people don't like editing. And as soon as they can afford to pay someone else to do it, they will. So a good market to be in, I think. To kind of wrap things up here, Carrie, if you had to simplify or distill some of the best advice you've received or that you have learned about running games thus far, what are are those couple of things that you would tell other players to encourage them or to, you know, give them some advice on running games for their friends, for their family, for their podcasts and streams, that kind of thing? I guess two pieces of advice. The first one is it is your responsibility to let the players tell their story. If you're not writing a story that they are acting out piece by piece by piece, it is their story you are guiding in. That's one big piece of advice. The second, I will die on this hill, only plan for what the players cannot change. You don't have to worry about your story being railroaded if you only plan the bones of the story. For example, Deadlands the Crossroads. My plan was like, oh, hey, there's a train. It's heading to St. Louis. The end. (laughs) I had the players make up the meat of the story, and I knew what the players couldn't change. And that's it. We don't have to plan everything out unless there are like triggered events or however you're wanting to do stuff like that. It is better for everyone, and I feel like easier to plan as well if you only plan for what the players cannot change. Wow. You know, a lot of people have given pieces of advice around planning, but that, did someone tell you that or did you come up with that phrase on your own? No, I came up with that. (laughs) Oh man. You need to write a book, Carrie. You need to write a blog. I don't know what, what you're into, but that is incredible. I say this a lot on this show, but it's something that I've kind of noticed and it's been in my head, but you have put it into words in a way that I have not been able to or have not done. And I've never heard anybody else give that exact advice either. So that's awesome. Only plan for the things that the players cannot change. That totally changes your planning game. You plan for the stuff that can't change, then you leave the rest of it up to whatever they're going to do. Wow. Yes, I love it. I (laughs) love it. It has been definitely a huge like mantra of mine for quite a few months now, and I, I will die on that hill. I'll stand by it. You should. That's a great hill to die on. I support it. I'll be on that <laughs> hill with you. I'll hold the flag behind you. Great, great. <laughs> okay. To wrap things up, tell us where people can find your work. You mentioned Street Wolves, but anything else upcoming that you want to share with people as far as games that you're planning or other content that you're planning, anything like that? You can find me at Smith 2012 on YouTube and Twitter. That's K-E-R-R-I Smith 2012. And we've started an Outbreak Undead campaign. It started September 7th, and it is this 
zombie apocalypse campaign. It's gritty. It is definitely meant for more mature audiences. But if you're into zombies and you like blood, gore, and horror, check that out. Catch up and you can watch live with us on Wednesday at 6 p.m. Central Time. October's coming up. We're going to have two Halloween specials going out in October. So stay tuned for the spooks. And we're also running Crossroads Chronicles right now, where we bring in guest GMs. We're bringing in as many guest game masters and as many TTRPG systems as we can without repeating any. And the guest game master gets to run a system of their choice. We have had Warhammer Soulbound. We have had Mothership. And Friday, we will have Kids on Bikes. So keep a lookout for that. Yeah, that's one of those games I've heard a lot about and have always wanted to try. And I know it's got tons of permutations that Doug Lewandowski's made, like kids on brooms and teens in space teens or something. Space. Anyway, yeah. I, there's like a dozen of them and they sound really fun. And I've always wanted to check them out. So I will have to. Sounds like you've got your spooky season all sorted out. Mm hmm. Spooky season's the best season for Carrie anyway. <laughs> it is. Oh, I love it. Thanks so much for sharing, Carrie. I will make sure to put your link tree and links to kind of some of those more specific things in the episode notes so everybody can go check that out as soon as they're done listening to this. But thank you so much for joining me. I know that you've been working really hard on all of the stuff you've made so far, and it sounds like you're working even harder to give the people what they want. So really excited to see what else you turn out and excited for this other exciting Crossroads games announcement. So I'll be keeping an eye on your work closely. Thank you so much. And this was so much fun. If you ever want me back, I'll make time. (laughs) (laughs) All right. I'll keep that in mind. Thanks, (laughs) Gary. 